Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Vita Learning webinar. Uh, today, we're having uh, Mr. Eugene Rosengert uh, speak on dentures. Hi, hi, Eugene. How are you doing today? Hi, Jim. I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, you're in Utah. So, how's the weather? Good, bad? Getting to be spring, starting to turn green. Uh, definitely, definitely spring-like. Uh, I think we're about supposedly it's going to be 60 degrees today and probably around 70 tomorrow, so it's warming up. Wow, that's getting close to California weather. We're, we've we've had a cold spell here. Yeah, hot and cold. It goes back and forth. It's it's desert living. Yeah. So, well, welcome. Uh, greatly appreciate you joining us today, uh, providing some excellent uh, education to all our audience. Um, that are interested in uh, the workflow for digital, how to morph the traditional techniques in with the digital, um, all those um, different areas that may be um, troublesome for, the, for, for some. Uh, some have questions, so today hopefully we'll be able to answer everyone's questions. Absolutely. Just a, um, a few reminders uh, for the audience. Your phone is on mute. So if you'd like to have a question read out, please use that question box. On the panel on your right-hand side of your screen, you should see a uh, go to webinar panel. Go to the questions box, open that up, and then just uh, send in a, a question. And then at the end of the program, we'll answer those questions during the Q&A session. Th today's webinar is recorded. We will post it, give it us a couple of days. We'll, we post these on the uh, Vita YouTube channel. Uh, so give us a couple of days, that'll be up posted. And then those of you that are looking for CE, I'll go back to this again after the presentation, but uh, we will follow up after this webinar. Uh, you will, we will use your registration information if you provided us with your CDT numbers and things of like that. Uh, we will provide you with CE. Um, for this uh, program. So Eugene um, Rosengert out of Utah uh, has been working in the dental industry since uh, 1996. Uh, he be began as a dental assistant, later becoming an in-house dental laboratory technician, specializing in removable prosthodontics. And Eugene, were you, were you in the military? I was, but not as a... Um... Not as a dental technician. I was a. I was no, a but uh, is that where your dental career started? No, sort of. No, no. no, I, no. I decided, okay. I decided to take a little uh, sideways turn. I thought I'd try out electronics uh, in the military. All right. Went back to dental. Well, dental. You know, we use electronics. Yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> it's applicable. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Eugene's education includes a bachelor's degree in denturism from American Denturist College and a certificate in dental assisting and radiology. He's published several peer review articles on the subject of removal and implant supported prosthetics and currently lectures in the United States and internationally. Uh, Gene and his family currently reside in Sandy, Utah. He owns and operates Apple Dental Laboratory and is an adjunct uh, faculty instructor for the American Denturist College. Welcome, Eugene. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. And again, thank you very much for uh, doing this presentation for us. And a reminder for all the audience that you're on mute, if you'd like to throw in some questions, please do so during the program. And at this time, Eugene, I am going to make you the presenter. And okay. you can... Uh, Show your screen. All right. So right now we have you up. I think you can see my screen now. Yes, we are good to go, it looks like. Okay, excellent. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to, I guess, not see you all here, but I know you guys are all here because I can see a list of all the people that are here. Uh, my name is Gene, and uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about um, integrating your digital workflow into your analog everyday lab kind of stuff that we deal with, and a lot of us are dealing with this for a lot, a lot of years. Um, on this slide right here, there's some of my contact information, 
my phone number, my email, and my LinkedIn account. Um, if you have any questions after this, uh, please feel free to go ahead and contact me. I'll try to help you out as much as possible. And then uh, let's move ahead. So fabricating emerging, uh, embracing emerging digital denture fabrication with traditional, uh, traditional best practices. Like a lot of you folks, I have started with analog because that's just the way you do things. You know, digital has been around for some time, but when it comes to removable, it's a fairly newer thing, you know, and uh, I've been doing removable digital aspects for about, mm, I want to say two and a half years, or about maybe three. Not to be lying about this, I don't, I don't want to overqualify myself here. But in my opinion, when it comes to digital and analog, there's a lot of schools of thought on this. And then some people are really adamant about you know keeping it all digital or some people are trying to keep it all analog and not trying to embrace digital aspects of things because of either costs or maybe some people think the quality is not quite there. In my opinion, um, I like to combine things. I like to take things uh, that are working for me and integrate them with my workflow. There are things that I can do better analog and there are things that I can do better digitally. So I'll take those things and I'll combine them together to get the best possible outcome uh, for my patients. So in the beginning, I'm gonna show you a couple of cases that I worked with uh, with these particular patients to try to better uh, the final results. And then we'll talk about some additional stuff that uh, we've created using digital workflow and maybe also talk about how to get into digital if you are just starting out. So this particular patient, this is the first case I'm gonna be showing you, is actually a friend of mine. And uh, initially she had very severe perio uh, of both maxilla and mandible on her residual dentition. And when the immediate upper denture was fabricated, we were actually not able to take a traditional impression because of how severe the perio was. And the patient was adamant about not getting teeth taken out before getting dentures in because they were very um, self-conscious about their looks. So instead of taking a traditional impression, we took an intraoral scan at the time. And my friends at Cotton Orthodontics Lab actually helped me do that. Um, they it came in into the clinic uh, of the University Hospital and they had their three-shape scanner with them because at the time we didn't have a three-shape scanner there. And one thing I've noticed is that even though the, the scan was pretty precise, it was a bit difficult getting into the vestibule and getting some parts uh, scanned uh, to get really good periphery. With this being a, an immediate denture and, and being a um, uh, something that we're gonna be used temporarily and we're going to reline it as you can see right here, uh, I felt that it wasn't too big of a deal because the other only other way was to either get the teeth taken out or try doing it um, a traditional impression, which wasn't the case. So we, we decided to go this route and actually worked out pretty good. We were able to give a soft tissue reline. At that time, she did not want to get uh, the mandibular teeth taken out. So uh, the lower denture was actually made after the upper denture was done. And there's a story behind that as well. So there's the case here. Here's another view of that. Just a couple of different views of the case. So as you can see right here, she has a pretty defined cant on here and um, that's causing some aesthetic issues. Also, I wanted to address those buckle corridors as much as I could, but uh, this is what we did. So. The reason why she uh, ended up with a lower uh, immediate denture as well is because she actually had bladed implants um, on the mandible and she was going to hold off some time till she got some more money put together um, and to get those extracted and get the lower denture finished. Uh, and preferably what we we're planning on doing and maybe doing them as a pair. Uh, well, what happened is that the infection on those bladed implants got so bad that she was actually experiencing paresthesia on her mandibles. So she had to have an emergency extraction and emergency uh, denture was fabricated, just something to take place like a healing denture. So once that was done, uh, my whole thing about fabricating patient's dentures, I like to get as much information as possible from the existing situation so I can incorporate it into the final results 
and get a better outcome if it's possible. So my go-to in this case is to duplicate a patient's existing denture and try to get uh, a bite registration to final impression one. I, I'd like to save appointment time also. Another thing, if you are using a patient's existing denture as a duplicate, it's a lot easier to establish a bite rather than starting from a new. So if we didn't go this route, for example, we would probably do a regular custom, uh, regular initial impression with alginate, fabricate a custom tray. From that custom tray, we'd either take a final impression and make a, a bite trim or do a bite trim custom tray uh, all, all together in one. So this way it saves a lot of time and also gets uh, pretty decent results in bite registration. So for her particular case, I started uh, taking the impressions uh, in the clinic and then uh, what happened is that I did not realize the fact that her mandibular impression was insufficient and her actual her mandibular denture was insufficient and, and was short in her retromolar pants because we did with the slight border molding and then took a wash impression and, and started realizing, you know what, uh, we're actually getting a worse fit now than we did before uh, we started with this impression. So there's something was interfering. A lot of times what I'll start doing, first of all, is I'll start checking on the periphery. If if the denture is overextended somewhere, at least she show through there and I'll try to adjust it. But in this case, there was no show through. And what I realized looking at it closely is that the posterior was really, really deficient. When you're dealing with a case, uh, when you're duplicating a denture or maybe it's just a custom tray uh, and you have pretty severe deficiency in a tray or a duplicate denture, it's always a good idea to build it back up. There's a couple of ways you can do it. My, my favorite one is to use compound because it's rarely available in most clinics um, and it works pretty well. The problem with compound though, it's a bit brittle. Um, there's a material that out there and they're made by different companies. It's actually, um, they're, they're granules, they're thermoplastic granules that you can put in hot water and you can mold the tray with it as well. And what they will allow you to do is create uh, a better extension, but it won't be brittle. So you can do that as well. So we did that here and you can see how deficient it was on, on the distal here. And from that point, obviously we're going to refine the edges with some medium body and did a light body wash right there. So we took the impression. And actually, if you go back and look closer, you can see the um, the areas where they're not fully healed yet from where the bladed implants were taken out. The infection on this, in this case was very, very severe and we're getting really bad issues. Um, you know, at, the, at this point, she was hoping to get some implants put down the line, but you know, we wanted to wait and everything else. But um, so here is her uh, maxilla. Here's her mandible. So I pour everything up, I mount the case, and I scan the case in, okay? So once the case, uh, case gets scanned in, her, um, her setup is done digitally in this case. The reason why I like doing a digital setup, I don't necessarily, I won't necessarily go all the way through and fabricate a, uh, a printed or a milled prosthesis, but this, from the setup standpoint, it works very well for me because I can do a lot of corrections. Now for this particular case, we're using uh, Vita Vigo teeth. And then um, the way the Vigo teeth are designed is they're actually shorter and they don't have any undercuts. So they're optimal for, you know, uh, using specialized bond to get those teeth bonded directly to the base plate uh, that it's either printed or milled. Now, the teeth are actually pre-made, so you can't really um, adjust them digitally per se, and, but there are some ways around it. And I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll talk about that right now. There's, so there are quite a few positives here. The positive is that you're actually using a regular denture tooth, so you're getting all the aesthetics of it. Um, because it's a specially digitally designed tooth, you're able to get really good adaptation to the base plate. There is, though some things you need to do uh, specifically uh, dealing with case selection. Now, for this particular case, and there are some cases that I deal with, when you create the setup and you print just the base plate, you can see if you've got recent extractions, for example, if a patient has a pretty big ridge, it hasn't had a lot of residual ridge resorption, you're going to end up with perforations through the base plate. 
which is fine if you're doing the protocol like I'm going to show you. But if you are planning on bonding the teeth directly to the base plate, that's not going to work. So you're going to have to sidestep this a little bit because you're only able to bond those teeth to the base plate if there's no perforations of any kind. Okay. But for this case, I had some perforations and uh, I set everything up. Now, when I went to print the base plates, I wanted to put some reinforcement here so it reduces the shrinkage of the plate. There's a couple of things that you could do to reduce um, distortions. Uh, a lot of times the angulations uh, will help quite a bit. Personally, nowadays, the way that I print my base plates or even duplicate dentures, um, that's one thing actually I forgot to mention, the duplicate denture that I showed you before, I basically took the patient's denture, I scanned it in. You can either do that chair side if you have an intraoral scanner, or you can send it to the lab where we do that a lot of times at the clinic uh, when the patients just drop off, the, drop off their dentures in the morning, the lab picks it up, scan it in, and then the, the patient is given their denture back and they don't have to worry about it. The good, th also the plus thing there is when you're using a duplicate denture to make corrections and you're not using the patient's existing denture to make corrections, you can't really mess things up with the patient because speaking from experience here, unfortunately, when the, patients come, uh, when the patient comes in and they tell you that the, this is the worst denture they had, they hate all of it and they don't, they don't even wear it, but the second you touch it with a pen piece, it becomes the best denture they've ever seen and you just ruined it for them. So uh, duplicating a denture really works out well, but I digress. So here I've, I've created a file to print the maxillary and the mandibular base plates. These are just stabilizers I put in additionally after creating a file, I put those in the mesh mixer. There are some printing software, printing sliceware that will actually allow you to incorporate those directly in my case, I was just using a free software called Mesh Mixer, which I usually use a lot of times for a lot of my things like model building, uh, correcting files, adjusting files, things like this. I highly recommend you guys look into that software because it's free. You can download it. There's quite a few tutorials on YouTube on how to use it and how to help you guys out. So if you're just trying to get into digital, that might be a little really good way of just uh, dipping your toes in the, in the cold water. Okay. So I did the setup. Now this setup looks a little bit differently because if you look at the base plate, let me go back. And the base plates, you, as you can see right here, look like they have some detail to them. But on here, if we go forward, it looks like detail is done in wax. That's just my own personal thing. Number one, I like to add a little bit of detail to things. Number one. Number two, if you add a little bit of texture with wax, on the facials, if you don't follow the traditional workflow of cementing the teeth to the base plates, but if you are going to process things, this will actually help you quite a bit when you're going through the boil out technique. Because if you simply have a base plate that's sitting in the stone, even though it has a little bit of flex to it, depending obviously on the type of material that you're using to print things, uh, having a small layer of wax in the front will help to divest things a little bit better, okay? So for her, we did a try, and as you can see, we've corrected the cant, and we actually, oh, you know, closed up those buckle corridors a little bit, so we don't have the, those big uh, black uh, triangle areas in there. Um, she seemed pretty happy. Her bite was really nice and stable, and one of the reasons, even though we didn't do a gothic arch tracer, the reason it was nice and stable is because we used her existing denture as a duplicate to register the bite, because she didn't wear those dentures for a long time. She didn't destabilize the bite. She wasn't going prognathic into class three or anything like that. We were able to just do things where we need to be. And we opened up her bite just slightly to get the results that we wanted to get, okay? And then I just processed the case traditionally. I know that it's not the traditional workflow. You want to be able to go all the way through things digitally if you can. But if you're having some kind of limitation somewhere where the case collection doesn't fit, it's okay because you could just go halfway to this point and from that point after you can go traditionally. You're combining best of both worlds because if I go back on her case, if I'm doing a try and for example, and the midline's off and I need to change it, for me, it's pretty easy because I can go back into software. I could just move the midline with two clicks and print another base plate or just print the whole try in monolithically to try in. If I have a can that I need to fix, I can bring in this picture into my three shape and I can line this up with the setup and I can actually fix the cant and print another one. 
Another cool thing that I can do, I can do several different setups with the same patient. Let's say, for example, I'm now using the uh, the teeth that um, that are carded, and I'm going to do monolithic setup. You could just go ahead and do that, and do with several different libraries and change things around, and you could do a couple of different try-ins to satisfy the patient's aestheticness. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do digitally that I haven't been able to do in analog, or at least not being able to do it fast. Okay, so process it. Here's a little close up, and you know she has a very nice and beautiful smile, and then she seemed to be pretty happy with the case. I kind of like the way the way it presented. I don't see any major issues with this. So, and the coolest thing is, is that when we put this case in, you remember that she had all these issues with implants and the tissue being you know, healing in different places and, and the initial denture being short you know, with us trying to correct it. But even with all of these things, we're able to all right, let's turn. achieve suction, okay? Not amazing suction, but we got suction. So at least we know we have a nice stable denture. We have suction because with this patient getting implants right now is not really an option, okay? We need to make sure things stabilize. We, see what's going on with that paresthesia and everything else. So and she actually, even if the clinician decided to put the implants on, the patient themselves decided to wait on it. So let me go through a couple of steps on 3Shape on how we um, how we actually set up these cases, okay? So when we bring things in, this is uh, this is just a regular uh, demo case that I use these models a lot for, for the courses, the regular Vita models. So we have upper and lower, and we have a bite registration here, okay? It's very important to know things about model analysis, to understand why model analysis is present and why are we using it. You know, because the way that the software is setting up these dentures for you is based on model analysis, because it looks at the incisive papilla and it says to itself, you know what, the incisal edge of things is going to be seven to nine millimeters from the center of the incisive papilla and it will go from there. These uh, two major pa pairs of palo rugae are going to be your canine lines. So this is what it's using to give you the presentation of the initial setup, okay? Tuberosities are also there for a reason because it's going to tell you, you know what, we don't want to set teeth past a certain point. On the lower, we see, we have the ridge. Uh, this is our, going to be our canine placement because we also know that slightly behind the, uh, the buccofrina is going to be the position of our first premolars. Our retromolar pads are going to generate our static lines and lines of correction. It will also allow us to see how far back we can set up the occlusion. All these things are uh, are, are going back from Professor Gerber's studies on model analysis and things like this. Okay, so once you have all these things marked and you go forward, as you can see right here, all these things you need to mark on the maxillary and the mandibular, and then you go forward, it will actually tell you to mark the outline for the denture. Now, you could go ahead and be very precise here, as you can see, as I was, or lately, to be honest with you, I just go all the way through like this without worrying about the, the Frina, and I'll just adjust them after printing. It just seems to work better for me that way. But either way works fine, so don't, don't worry about it. Okay, and this one is for the lower. So what it does, it actually uh, gives you the path of insertion, and it actually, if you could see right here, there's a couple of th settings right here. So if you don't like the path of insertion that the computer is generating for you, it's usually pretty good on the mandible. On the maxilla, sometimes it blocks out too much in the anterior. So what you can do is actually rotate the model to the point where you can generate less of an undercut. And then you click this button called set from view and you actually block off less things. Now, if you're printing base plates or a setup that you're going to be trying in, you want to make sure to block out undercuts. And usually blocking out at three degrees, which is a preset, works out pretty well. If you're going to be printing a denture that's an immediate or you're going straight to processing, you want to make sure not to do that because a lot of times, obviously, you're dealing with soft tissue and these undercuts, you want to engage them rather than that and it'll actually help stabilize things. I prefer to not block out undercuts in, in, in software and adjust them chair side to make sure I find that nice point where it sits really well, but there's not too much space there, okay? And it gives you a presentation of the setup and you can choose right here. Like if you can see right here, I'm using Vita uh, Bionic Vigo teeth 
um, on the buckle setup. There's also a Gerber setup that you can use. And the difference is just the angulation of the posterior teeth. And I'm using the anterior teeth as well here. Now, when they say that, you know, it's just going to present to you and you just click, 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 and it's done, it's not really that simple. In some cases, it might be, but in majority cases, from my experience, you will need to be doing adjustments. Because the way that it presents, it doesn't necessarily present it to your bite rim. It presents it to the model analysis. And model analysis is an approximation. So most of the time, I'll have to move those teeth slightly more anterior or, uh, or palatally in order to get it within the wax rim. Because remember, it was seven to nine millimeters from the incis uh, from the incisive papilla, middle of the incisive papilla to the incisive ledge. So is it seven millimeters or is it eight? Is it nine? Or maybe it's even more one way or the other because we're all individuals, right? We all have our own set of uh, standards. It doesn't fit into the computer. So we're gonna have to adjust it and you need to make sure you know what you're doing. Another thing is that, let me see if I have a lateral view here. Yeah, another thing you can see here is that uh, the model analysis is gonna show you past which point, you can see that red line here, past which point you wanna, don't wanna have any occlusion. So in this case, I ended up dropping a second premolar. So you can either drop a second premolar or a second molar, either on one side or on both sides. But you have to also be careful because when you drop that, it doesn't automatically even out the posterior line. So if you have a first um, premolar there and you drop a second one, the line doesn't shift to make it straight. So you're gonna have a step there. So from that point, you're actually gonna have to manually move those teeth to even out the lines. And also a lot of times I have to mess with the canine areas as well because they're going too straight up and down uh, instead of having the cervicals um, tucked out a little bit and the sizals tucked in, having that little bit better looking, uh, in my opinion, shape. So there are adjustments you need to do. And a lot of times the anterior teeth need to be angulated differently because the basal surface is maybe not sitting properly on the, on the middle of the crest of the ridge. So you'll end up bringing, bringing the cervicals in and bringing the incisals out to minimize the overjet. The cool thing is though, you have the ability to run an articulator and, and get things adjusted uh, in balancing. But here's the, and the other slide I wanted to show you. Well, you could see we had our first premolar, but because we dropped the second premolar and the line doesn't really just change it, you have that step right here and it doesn't look very good. On the mandible, actually, it looks a little bit better. It's a little bit smoother transition, but on, if we go back on the maxilla, you could really see that. So you could do a couple of things. You can either bring this uh, premolar out a little bit to match uh, the, um, the canine or bring the uh, second, uh, first and second molars in just a little bit. Also, depending obviously on the crest of the ridge, how well you can play inward and outward with that particular situation, okay? So there's the other one. And, and these are all the cool things you can integrate. We, you have the, uh, the plane of occlusion, you can check and make sure it's going directly to it. It's not uh, slicing through it in any point more than the other, so you don't end up with a possibly canted smile, okay? And this is the articulate I was referring to. You can go ahead and do your working and balancing. Me personally, excuse me, I'm a fan of using lingualized occlusion and using a group function uh, setup. So I'm just pretty much looking at that all my anterior and posterior teeth in, in one side end up working together and then on the other side. The only time I'm looking for a balance is my protrusive balance when I want the teeth when they're going into protrusive, I want three points contact with my incisals and my, and my molars somewhere touching as well, okay? As you can see right here in protrusive, these are my protrusive contacts right here. Okay, so the setup ends up looking something like that. Okay, let me show you another case. Also, very similar type of situation. The patient comes in, patient has a denture they've been wearing for a while. They were initially pretty happy with it, even though there were some issues with it. But then the teeth are starting to wear out. They don't, they don't function very well. You have to remember that even the best possibly made denture is only about 20 to 25% as efficient as regular dentition. So if you're starting with a really good denture and, and it's only at 25%, somewhere here, you're probably at five, 10%. So he wanted to get something new made. So if you're looking right here, he's not really canted anywhere. His bite is actually 
uh, not protruding because he actually warned a posterior occlusion fairly quickly. So he's actually uh, closed up a little bit and not allowing his, his mandible to slide forward. Therefore, his bite is probably pretty stable there. Usually when I see wear on the lower anteriors and the teeth are slightly more forward than they need to be, then I start to worry a lot more about occlusion. And then I will start bringing in gothic arch traces and such, okay? So for him, as you can see right here, you know, pretty worn out. But if you look in the back, this is where I see the real issue. I know that somewhere around here, we have a retromolar pad. So obviously these dentures are not stable at all. If with the uppers, you get somewhat somewhat of a stability. It's not really suction. I think it's more of a, a buccal tissue stability and, and the muscle training to keep that in. And on the mandible, is just jumping all over the place. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that the patient has residual ridge resorption. So when the ridge resorbs down and outward, the denture doesn't. So the denture all of a sudden becomes overextended and impinges on the muscles. And every time the patient starts moving around, it starts to jump around. And also when I see things like this, when there's a lot of reduction in the back, chances are this denture initially was severely overextended and the clinician was adjusting this denture everywhere they could just to cause less and less pain and ended up just overshortening it in the back as much as they could. Or um, it was just never made right in the first place because what I see a lot of times is that you'll get a stock tray used for the final uh, for the initial impression and the stock tray is not adjusted to incorporate the retromolar pad areas in there so it just goes straight into them and shortens them quite a bit and then the custom tray gets even shorter from that point and you never builds that up and because of that you end up with <clears throat> a deficiency so if you're doing an initial impression with a stock tray you need to make sure you adjust it or better yet, use a specifically a specific tray for edentulous patients, either an edentulous tray or frame cutback tray, which I'm personally a fan of. Okay, so this is our two dentures with a little bit of a soft liner still in there. So we scan that in, we print a replica, and then we give the patient their dentures back. As you can see right here, they're pretty short. And there was a little bit of deficiency of the posterior parallel seal area on the maxilla as well. So we build it back up with, uh, with compound there. And what I generally do before I start taking the impression, I will check for overextensions. If they're pretty aggressive, I can see them just by visualizing things, I'll get them adjusted. But a lot of times what we'll do is we'll take a little bit of extra light body or extra light viscosity light body, put it in there and use it kind of like fit checker put it in there and any kind of show through that we're seeing, we're going to adjust it. We can't really do that on patients existing denture because we don't want to mess with it unless they ask us to. But on our duplicates, we can do whatever we want just to make sure we get a good result, okay? And on the lower, as you can see right there, there was a quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of denture missing. So we ended up building that um, with compound again. Check everything, make sure there are no overextensions use medium body to take the impression because the tray was a little bit more reduced than I wanted to and do a wash with extra light viscosity. Now, the thing that I'm looking here, uh, some of the things I'm looking at, at is, you know, some of these areas are not very well impressed. I'm not too worried at this point because at a try-in stage, if there are any issues, I can do a wash and get a process. I think I was 90% here where I needed to be. And I taught, told myself, you know what, if this is going to be a problem, I'll get a wash impression, okay? On the upper, this probably could have been adjusted a little bit better, but the retention was really good. And these little micro uh, micro bubbles, well, this one's micro, this one's kind of not really that micro. Um, they didn't interfere that much either. And I felt like this was a good result. Um, I marked the posterior palatal seal area. I, just in case we got a stick bite, just to make sure we're not canted anywhere. So pretty much get everything mounted up, um, get everything brought in and get it scanned in. So once I get scan everything in, I did the setup digitally. I went ahead and I printed the base plates. And once again, because of this type of situation, we ended up with holes through it, okay? But in his case, I actually did not use Vigo teeth. One thing you can actually do, especially if you're doing this kind of setup, you can just basically use, in my case, I was using VitaPen Excel teeth because there's a digital library for VitaPen Excel teeth. I just brought that in 
And when I put the teeth in, you can see they're actually sewing through the, the holes, the perforations through the base. So all I did basically just went ahead and ground them through to make sure they're not interfering with anything. Because I knew from that point on, I was sure that I wasn't going to do the final processing digitally, it was going to be analog. So this didn't really matter because I was going to be processing it to the model, okay? So we did a setup and once again, I adjusted the facials a little bit with wax for a couple of reasons. I like to bring my own aesthetics in a little bit. And also when I'm going to be processing, it'll be a little bit easy to divest or during the boil out to remove the base plates, okay? So we go in for a try-in, everything looks good. Just process it regularly, remount back an articulator, adjust occlusion as we need to adjust and we just go from there okay and this was um i'm pretty sure give me just a second folks let me just double check something um i kind of got my slides out of, out of the way this was at the try and stage and then we went to process it just to, i just use a traditional press packing technique but you can see i have some wax here so it makes it a little bit easier to get out and processes beautifully just just the final process i was remounted and just polished and when i go to deliver these cases what i will do is um before i even start using pressure indicating paste or anything like this i'll grab some ultra light body impression material i'll put it in there and i'll take a functional impression and i'll look and i'll see are there any show throughs right here for example and right here they're going to gonna cause some issues possibly with my retention okay and I also will look on things from the uh, from the facial now here I adjusted those shows there show throughs there but on the facial I'm sorry I skipped the slide on the facial right here I could look at these things and I'm like well you know what it's kind of impinging in this area a little bit and it might be causing my buckle tissues to pu push the denture out so I'll adjust and repolish everything here as well okay and once I do that, it actually fits pretty well, okay? And on this patient in particular, we actually ended up getting a suction on him. Now, for for example, this is just a demo case. This is the case that I showed you guys um, that we set up uh, in three shape. These are just uh, Vito Vigo teeth. And if you look closely, the teeth should just fit perfectly in there because there are no undercuts. All you have to do is properly adjust the glue space in your software anywhere between 0 0.2, 0 0.02, and 0 0.05, if I'm not mistaken. But depending on what you're doing, because you have to worry about the shrinkage of your printed base plate material. Uh, if you're milling, you have to worry about compensations that are associated with, with the milling strategies and things like this. So I recommend before actually doing a case and, and printing it and getting it done, I would run some tests and maybe just a small area, either milling or printing it to see how the fit is. Because you want to have something like this where it adapts pretty close, but just a little bit of a space for the uh, for for the cement, okay? And this is the cement we're using in this particular case. Uh, it's a Vita Bionic Bond. It's a two-part solution, and it works pretty well. Um, I don't have any cases personally intraorally for a long period of time, um, but what I've heard from people that are actually doing it, it works pretty well. Okay, so it kind of looks like this if you are. Uh, if you guys are looking for base plate material to print that looks like this, you're not gonna find it. This is actually, I took a regular color and I actually started adding more colors to it to see what I can do. So I apologize, this is a bit of a trick that I was doing for just a demo case, okay? Now, another thing that you can do, one of the bigger concerns that I see out there and people saying, you know what, uh, digital dentures are just not don't have a lot of pizzazz out there I don't, I don't know if that's the right word but they, they don't jump out of you now if you're using a system where you're actually using a carded tooth like you're doing right here these are vigo teeth we're using excel teeth well that's no longer an issue on the tooth portion but if you're trying to actually bring out a lot of um, color and everything else with the uh, with actual base plate material what you can do is you can digitally do a cutback on the base plate material and then later on uh, build it up with composite depending on what system you're using you can just kind of layer that in this particular um this particular composite is gc but there's many other brands out there and i've seen some really good good results with all different kinds okay now one more case i wanted to show you where digital um 
kind of worked out pretty well for us. Um, and, and what we did by mixing things analog and digitally. Now, if you look, uh, sorry, for some reason, I just clicked through that, my apologies. Okay, so if you look right here, the dentist actually, I was, I was working as a tech on this case. The dentist just took a denture that the patient had, they printed a replica of it, and they took a wash impression. One thing I want to caution you, and you can see that right here, when you take in a patient's existing denture and you make a duplicate, make sure adjust the periphery first before taking an impression, because if the denture is overextended and you add material to it, chances are you're only going to overextend it even more, okay? Another thing that I do that I wanted to mention uh, digitally, if you have a denture with severely sufficient area right here when you're scanning it in, there's another thing you can do. In this particular case, I just took some putty and put it on the back, and when I scanned it in, I already had a file that had some backing to it, okay? You can actually even chair side, take some compound, add to it, and adapt it better intraorally if you wanted to, if you had the time. But if you don't, doing this right here and just adjusting the base down the line works pretty well, okay? So this particular case, they actually uh, did a copy and then they ended up opening up the bite. So this is not this case, it's a little bit different case, just so you guys know. But um, I was just showing you guys what can be done. Now on this one, I mounted this up and then I just used a regular base plate. Back in the day when I did this, I just did my base plates and analog. Nowadays, I do all my base plates digitally. Um, is it better or is it worse? I can't really tell you, but because I have kind of a workflow that I'm doing, it works better for me because I can do a lot more cases this way. And actually, uh, because they're done digitally, I've actually have my wife help me scan these in and design these. So it saves me time quite a bit. And it was a lot easier for me to uh, train somebody who doesn't do things analog to do base plates digitally for me. Now, I will obviously, I, once they're printed, I have to adjust them manually to, to make sure they're perfect. But blocking out undercuts digitally is a lot easier than doing an analog. And I never have to worry about the base plate getting locked in onto the model and destroying the model that way. But in this case, I got everything mounted up. And I actually did things uh, analog from taking a duplicate from the denture that was sent to me, okay? And it, when the doctor told me, you know what, I want the teeth moved back to, you know, two or three millimeters and midline shifted possibly, well, I had to take some masking tape, put it on my table and do it that way. If I was to do this digitally nowadays, which I have this ability, because this is a bit of an older case, I would have just a couple of clicks of a button, moved everything back, two to three millimeters and maybe move the middle line if I needed to. So that's another thing that really helps out from that point, okay? Another thing that I've done a lot and I really, really am a big fan of is uh, utilizing Gothic arch tracers because a lot of times when the patients have an unstable bite and, and you're trying to establish proper occlusion, proper centric relation in this case, um, you you would like to use a gothic arch tracer. The issue that I start running into, these things are not that inexpensive and uh, getting them done for a lot of cases, I just started running out of parts. So uh, with the help of some friends, we've actually developed a digital protocol to get this done. Now, this is the older version where still we were using a metal screw that we're putting it in. The newer versions are actually all printed and, and getting things done is a lot easier. Now, if you get a case like this, for example, where we also have a duplicate denture and we mounted everything up with a bite, and this patient is not a skeletal class three, this patient is a prognathic class three that they have acquired over the years because their posterior occlusion has been worn down. So for me, if I'm going to reestablish their proper occlusion, if I set up everything here, chances are they're gonna have an alligator bite, as I call it, right? Because they're gonna start biting on their back teeth again the muscles will relax and you're gonna have an open bite in the anterior. So what I'd like to do is establish uh, establish proper occlusion. So in cases like this, a lot of times what I can do is I can bring it in digitally. I'll do a full setup like I did right here. And then I'll actually remove the posterior teeth and then uh, I'll incorporate a Gothic tracer with it. So if I go back, you can actually do an anterior try-in so you want to make sure and, and check and see if things are looking good. And then posteriorly, we can take a new registration and then just reset to that if we need to. Now, uh, as you can see, a lot of times on these teeth, these teeth are actually smooth. And I'm not 100% sure if this is a Vita library or not. 
And the reason why I'm saying that, because the Vita library has a noised output. So if you're printing a monolithic, if you didn't just scan the denture in, if you're actually doing a setup and want to print a monolithic, what you're going to end up happening is that the facial surfaces of teeth are going to have like little ruffles on them. Okay. So um, I don't know if I'm going to get fired for this or not, but I actually have developed a protocol um, on how to enmesh mixer just to smooth that out really easy. I mean, obviously it's not going to match the Vita teeth exactly. So you can't just process it and stick the Vita teeth in there, but it will give it enough reduction of that fuzzy thing that doesn't, if the patient is aesthetically conscious and you're doing a, monolithic try-in you don't have to worry about it. it takes about five minutes in mesh mixer it doesn't really take a lot of effort but if you don't want to do that all you basically do is what i do uh is just print the base plate with the holes in it and just stick the uh, uh stick the actual uh carter tooth in there so there's a couple of cool things that you could do digitally that you haven't been able to do in analog as quick now the issue here for example if i needed to take a wash impression of this base plate this right here will be my way so i won't be able to take a wash impression because my or at least a functioning one because my tongue is not going to be able to go through all the movements so i decided to come up with it with a solution to make sure i have an ability to do a gothic arch tracer as well as to take a wash impression in this type of case so uh, what you'll see right here is you have your maxilla with actual tracing platform and on the mandible, this was an earlier variation, you can see these things just kind of go in there. They don't stay in on their own, so you actually have to use um, uh, sticky wax. So what I what I would do, like in this particular case, uh, let me go back. In this particular case, I wasn't sure if I needed to take a wash impression or not, so I created this file, but we ended up having pretty good stability, so we didn't end up taking a wash impression. So we just kind of loaded everything together and got our bite registration. But I wanted something that actually work a little bit better. And let me make sure we go back again. I think this is a video. Yes, it is. So at this point, we got um, our case. Hopefully you guys can hear this. Up and polished. So we have our upper with a tracing plate on top of it. And with lower, we're able to remove the tracer portion, do our final impression if necessary to refine everything, and then simply position this uh, to the needed path of insertion and just snap it into place when needed to do. And then we're able to do the tracing as necessary for our patients. Now, if you can't snap that in and you're having troubles, you can go ahead and just open this up a little bit. But just be aware if you're putting it in and out too many times, the uh, depending on what type of uh, printing material you're using, it can cause some fractures. If it does happen, all you need to do is just glue the pieces together with some sticky wax and it's still going to be workable. In my case, I've kind of built it, these um, areas so I can just go in and just kind of finesse it out of the, uh, out of the grooves just so the things don't break on me and I can kind of go back and forth if I need to put it back in there or remove it. Okay, folks, uh, hopefully this has been helpful to you and uh, maybe you guys can implement that in your practice as well. So that way you're able to take a functioning impression, obviously, and take a Gothic art tracer. So it, all the files for this, by the way, are available for free. Um, I've uploaded them to Thingiverse. So um, if you need more information about that, please contact me. I'll, I'll send you a link. Maybe we can actually attach a link to this webinar if we need to. Okay, so that's uh, another thing that we do. Uh, this is what it pretty much looks like when we print uh, base plates or custom trays. Now, another cool thing that you could do with this, is, and I'm, I'm, this is what I like about digital. You could actually better analog protocols and get better results with it. Now, if you are a fan of or at least knowledgeable about the fact of an altered cast technique, it's a really good way to get better adaptation to tissue with a uh, distal extension type of partial, like a Kennedy class one. Uh, and, and what we used to do is we used to uh, make these saddles that just custom tray resin and just border mold them and take impressions. Uh, what I do now is actually when the, when the uh, uh, framework is fabricated, I will actually scan in 
the framework together with the model and uh, I will uh, design in custom tray module a little custom tray that fits right over the the framework now I have to have this area right here connected first because I can't do it in two pieces it has to be one piece so I'll just later on just cut these areas right here right here and right here and you can see these things will fit really really well right on top of the uh, framework and this gets printed and just put right on top of the framework and all I do is I put a little bit of wax to kind of hold things together one of the things I really didn't like too much about uh, doing um, custom tray resin putting it on the saddles is the fact that it was difficult to remove with this just just pops right off it stays on really well when you have to do all the impression parts and everything else and even if you have to do like a setup for example this would be a really cool way to have base plates on there for the setup the only thing that i'd worry about a little bit when you when you uh flasking things in make sure the stone kind of goes close to that margin right here because if there's a bit of an undercut you might be able you might possibly lock this base plate in and you'll have a hard time digging out even though when it's hot water and you're doing a hot water boil out this will become more flexible it's not like uh not like uh visible like your uh custom tray material that stays rigid this stuff actually softens up kind of like orthodontic resin if you're doing a boil out technique okay so you just do a, a you know some base plates and bite registration you can do alter cast and bite all at the same time okay another thing that i like to do if you guys do implant supported stuff and you need to create or implant retain you need to create a surgical guide it used to be quite a bit of an ordeal for me to do things like this because i would do duplicate dentures in analog way right we use a flask put it in there inject acrylic take that out and i use a bird to cut all these areas through do a bone reduction do the area for the um uh, for the implant placement approximation and it would take a while it'll be just it's just a lot of dirty kind of stuff right because you had to like grind all this acrylic and a lot of times it'd be covered head to toe on this acrylic with printed materials it's a lot easier because what i do you actually don't even have to have like three shape to get this done all you have to do is have your software for uh for your scanner so that's the first thing you want uh, in my opinion like if you you're trying to get into digital the first things i would first very first thing i would do is download free software like three uh not three shape but that's not free uh like mesh mixer and look up videos on youtube on how to do things with mesh mixer and just play around with files you can download free files you can try to alter them make your base plates or, or whatever you want to do um and do that and then uh when it comes to equipment you can actually get a printer really cheap it won't be a dental printer per se but it'll be something you could do dental stuff with uh it's not recommended to use those printers for interoral because there's a certain FDA protocol that has to be followed. And with the FDA protocols, you have to have verified printers and verified post-processing things. So there's some dental printers that are not very expensive, uh, but there are also some non-dental ones that you can use for models or stuff like that. Uh, but the thing that I got, even before I got a printer, I actually got a scanner because that way i could acquire a lot more information and store that information as needed and if even though i didn't have a printer i was able to scan uh data and, and get the files altered and i could possibly outsource the printing to somebody else but you can't really outsource scanning unless you're actually shipping everything in there so for me the first piece of equipment to get was to get a scanner and there are a couple of different scanners i mean there's more than a couple scanners out there there's ones that are really precise that you're going to be doing like you can be doing implant workflow with and everything else but if you are somewhere and you know that you probably not going to be scanning implant stuff and you're basically going to be dealing with uh some soft tissue uh you know tissue supported uh prosthetics a cheaper scanner around five thousand dollar scanner will still do the work that you need and you don't have to have that the 12 to 15,000 and so so on and so forth kind of scanner so there are some options and with every year there's more stuff that's coming out on the market and it's getting cheaper and cheaper to get into these things so for this I really like to you know do them digitally and just print these okay and it works out so much better for me okay another cool thing that I'm able to do now that I've never been able to do before 
is when I get a case like this. So this patient is an obturator uh, patient case. And uh, every time the patient has uh, some kind of brackets for ortho, you know it's a nightmare to take an allergen or polyvinyl, right? So they'll do a scan, and the scan will actually work out pretty good for these things. The problem with the scan, and I showed you this, guys, I didn't show you, but we talked about this before, getting into the, you know, the deeper regions and the vestibule sometimes is not very possible, especially if the patient has like a limited opening. And we'll talk about this here in a minute when we talk about a couple of more cases. But with this particular case, I got the scan in and I could see that this area is deficient. So I designed a tray that fits over that model and the doctor took a new impression. Now, if you look closely, he only went to the brackets, right? He didn't go all the way there, but he got a much better impression of the defect right here. So what I was able to do is actually put up the model, scanned it in, and then I brought in both files, the initial impression and this one, into Medit Link, and it has an option to align two meshes together to compare, I think it was, I think they renamed it now, but it used to be called Compare. And I was actually able to suture those two together, and you could see a little bit of a, a suturing line right here, because first, was just a scan, right? There was no pressure on the palate at all. And the second one was the impression. And that difference in pressure, that's where that line of demarcation is. But still, I'm still able to get really, really good tooth uh, modeling and as well as defect right there. So I can actually take this and make a duplicate in stone if I need to and, and work on it that way, or I can work on this digitally if I need to. So there's a couple of different options. So some really cool things that you could do with this. So this was the next step. We're going to get a bite registration on later. Now, this is another case that I wanted to show you guys. We've got about, I think about 15 minutes. There should be just enough time to cover the two cases that I want to talk to you guys about. Um, I got a phone call. I, I, I do a lot of uh, consulting with the University of Utah General Practice Residency. They're a wonderful group of people, and I work like working with the residents and stuff like this. And they call me up and they go, you know what? We got a case where the patient is an um, oncology patient uh, and had uh, uh, segmented bone removal and, and the graft placed. And because of this, the patient has a very limited opening and we can't really get a stock tray in there. So what I recommend that they do is, is try to get a scanner in there because, you know, it's a smaller head. Than the stock tray it's not really that small but it's smaller than the stock tray and you can get some scanning done at least and this is exactly what they did um now for him you can see that the patient has some uh, dentition still remaining here and because of that we need to make sure to address that as well now this particular patient had radiation therapy so for him to get those teeth extracted we he needs to go through 30 hyperbaric oxygen dips prior uh, prior to the extractions and post extraction as well. So there's a lot of things that need to line up in order for us to do things and do things right, because if we don't, it's gonna create a big issue, okay? So they took a scan on the maxilla and on the maxilla actually ended up being a fairly good scan, but you can see this line right here. They didn't capture the posterior palatal seal area with the scan too well. So I actually ended up lengthening it up a little bit uh, digitally knowing full well it's going to be an immediate, it's going to be realigned. And actually in the vestibule, actually smooth things out a little bit as well. On the mandible, things were a little bit more problematic. So I had to find a solution that was not common, let's say. So what I decided to do is uh, a couple of things. First, when I printed the upper model, I duplicated it in stone because I knew I was going to be doing this case analog, okay? On the lower, when I printed it, I decided to take the areas that are deficient and build them up with putty because I knew the anatomy of the mandible and I knew that it kind of rotates in a certain direction and it goes up a certain way, knowing full well that I will need to probably adjust things, okay? But then I had to solve a problem of our limited mouth opening. I knew that if the stock tray doesn't fit in there, there's a probability that even the custom tray might not fit. So I need to be able to take this impression and create a model with something and then maybe down the line also think about how to fabricate a denture to a patient that has a problem. I still haven't come up with the last point, but we were able to solve this issue right here. So in, in custom tray module, I created a custom tray and actually put a couple of pegs in here on both sides bilaterally, right? And then when I brought into mesh mixer, 
I actually sliced the custom tray in two parts, and I also created a handle that fit intimately between those two. So the idea is when you take the impression, you can fill each tray individually, place them up at the same amount of time and lock them together with the handle, okay? So when we brought this into the clinic, I obviously had deficiencies on the, um, on the lingual side that we built up with, comp uh, with compound once again. And we actually added the material in there placed it in and locked it with the handle. Now, the idea was if this was not, if we were not able to take it out all in one piece, I could take the handle off. We could use scissors to slightly cut the material, fold it and take it out. And then we'd have to come up with something for base plate to be able to lock it in as well. Well, we got lucky and we're actually, we were able to take it all out in one piece. Now, if you see right here, I mean, obviously there's some deficiencies still on this thing and I poured it up. And we knew we, we can get a really good adaptation in some areas. So once the uh, base plate was fabricated, that's what I like about removal a lot of times, because we can take uh, we can take a uh, a situation where we have problems, and because there's so several steps involved in it, even though we're trying to save save time, but sometimes when we need to, in this case, for example, we have a base plate that we're going to do a bite registration with. That's still a good time to go ahead and take a wash impression. To make sure we correct things and if if we're able to do a try-in at that point well in this case we couldn't do a try-in but if we you're able to do a try-in you can also uh, do another wash impression try-in if you need to so there's a couple of times you can actually go ahead and correct things when you need to okay so for him i made a base plate and you can see i kind of shortened things around because i want to make sure um, to get better adaptation into rolling because we're going to do a wash impression uh, which we try we try to border mold it a little bit in this area and here is just a little bit show through, but we got it adjusted. And here's the bite registration. So the cool thing is, I remember we started with a situation where the patient can't even open their mouth. We got a really, really bad scan that we had to adjust. And then from there, we ended up doing what? We ended up just changing things around as much as we could. And for him, can you verify that for me? It's just a bite, bite registration. Open. And we got suction on the load. So cases like that. Not, this needed to be adjusted a little bit. We did it down the line. But even with that, we still got suction. Okay. Got a little stick bite just to make sure we got things evened out. You just view this way. And the case was set up and processed by a friend of mine, Susan from Howell Dental Lab, did a great job on this case. You know, you can see the defect right here. So it ended up actually working pretty well for this particular patient. Okay. Now, you're often dealt giving the situation where you can't per se skip a step or, or add an extra step to get things done, but sometimes you kind of have an extraordinary circumstances. And for this particular case, uh, this was during the height of COVID, and it was really difficult to see patients. So we're really trying not to bring them back too many times, especially because they have to be COVID tested every single time up in the clinic. So it creates problems. But we got this uh, impression in, and it was a lot of deficiency in a posterior parallel seal area, mostly due to the fact that the, um, uh, the, the teeth, I actually did not include that slide, I'm sorry, I duplicated the slide by accident. Um, on this one, the teeth are so facially proclined that they couldn't get the, the tray in there to take a better impression. So they had a deficiency on the upper vestibule and the posterior palatal area. But we wanted to take uh, the next appointment was for bite registration appointment. So I decided to come up with a solution to where I can uh, get a bite registration, but also get a new impression on there and hopefully get those two things incorporated. So first things first, I printed the base plate and created a, a wax rim. And then I made a custom trait, a, a, slight, uh, a partial custom trait to fit over the uh, base plate, okay? And that, for, and you can see right here the deficiency, uh, the angulation of the teeth, and those deficiencies in the vestibule as well. You can see it from the back. And on the custom tray, I incorporated a couple of magnets with patent resin. Okay, and I made a secondary handle to go facially because I know that if I'm going to try to make a custom tray, I can't really because of the way the teeth are so angled, I can't really get that in without causing some issues here because the path of insertion was all the way messed up. So. 
So intraorally, we, uh, we took a real line impression per se here, and we got the byte registration. From that point, we actually put alginate in the custom tray on the palette to fit over the uh, byte registration, and facially, we added polyvinyl. So we got two impressions. So you have here uh, the surface that's on the base plate with a real line impression. This right here is two types of alginate. We got the neocolloid for the lie body and the um, hydrogen 5 for the base. And the facial is done with, um, with uh, monoface impression material polyvinyl siloxane. So when you put it all together like this, you're actually able to box it up and pour up the impression. And this way you get good adaptation of posterior palatal seal. We don't have the deficiency on the on the anterior anymore right here so that's properly impressed right here a little bit overextended but still properly impressed and we got the angulation of the teeth and you see how severely they're angulated and this actually this case was actually ended up being a an immediate uh, denture so that's kind of cool so do you always need to come up with these kind of creative solutions for these kind of situations no obviously you don't like if you can't capture this you need to talk to your patient and say, you know what, I can't get a good impression. You have you know, severely procline anterior teeth. We have a couple of options. One of the best options is probably to get those teeth extracted and, 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 and do a setup for after you get healed up, or we can make you like a temporary denture that you can wear until you get healed up, okay? So that's another thing that you can do. On cases, uh, on, on cases where you have an existing denture, again, uh, going back to where we started, you don't necessarily have to take an impression of the denture to begin with. Uh, like for the, in this case, I was sent in the uh, the denture scan, uh, the opposing and a bite. And I, what I could do is actually in Mesh Mixer also, which is a free software, I can invert that scan and I can create a model from that denture. And by bringing that into three shape and using the denture as my wax rim and my inverted scan as my model, I can actually do a new setup. And what's cool is I can, like I talked to you guys before, I can bring in the patient's picture, if it's a high definition picture, I can line things up and change the angulation of teeth. I can change the side of teeth and I can see what it looks like with the patient's face. And I'm actually able now to bring in not just pictures, I can bring in scans of the patient's face and, and work in three dimension as well. I think it's better to bring in both because just scans sometimes don't do it, but scans in a picture works out pretty well. For, so for her particular case, I actually took that and I actually did a new setup and we did a try and just to see what it looks like for her. And she could wear this for a little bit and see how, what, what, how, how she likes it. For cases where we're dealing, for example, this is an actual case, by the way, when we're dealing with patients that are very um, demanding when it comes to their aesthetics, and they um, don't want to commit right away, and we don't want them to commit right away either. And, and spending all this time, let's say you're doing a full arch zirconia case, you don't want to end up uh, getting things done in zirconia, getting it some, uh, screwed in, and then the patient goes, you know what, I don't like this, I don't like that, and the other, or the bite is off. So printing or milling a prototype like this and then just adjusting the facials with some composite or some optiglase color works out pretty well. So cutback is done digitally. You clean up a little bit around the teeth right here and then you just fill it up with composite. So that's, that's also works really, really well for things like that. Now for her case, let me go back to the patient that I showed you before, this, this one. Uh, what we actually ended up doing after the implant placement was done, we actually ended up using her try-in for her custom tray. And as you can see right here, ended up making a model. These were Astra implants. Uh, bite registration, printed base plate again. I no longer do base plates or custom trays by hand. I just don't want to waste the time. Now, is it more expensive? Probably because I have to buy the equipment, I have to buy software, uh, the printing resin is not cheap, but because I've kind of streamlined the process, I don't really feel that difference. I, because I get a lot more stuff done that way and, and the cost difference doesn't really come into play. And the majority of my equipment is probably after now, maybe not the scanner, but definitely all my printers are paid for. Okay, so we didn't do the setup digitally, we did an analog. My implants were not positioned the best way. 
So we actually decided to do custom locators. Now, this is another thing that I started doing digitally. Beforehand, I was making um, uh, scans of my teeth in different ways when I was fabricating my bars. Uh, in the beginning, I was just using a scan of my wax up. So if I go back, I would just scan this in. And when we would fabricate the bar, we kind of had to guess where the tooth ended. And that created a problem because you don't really know where the tooth ends. And lots of times what happens is the bar actually ended up being uh, hitting right on the tooth. So I would have to adjust the, adjust the bar or the tooth or a lot of times both. Okay. So then I started to kind of try just to remove the teeth from the wax. and didn't really have a whole lot of success with that. Uh, and then I started using verticulators, which is just like these articulators just go up and down. But lately, what I started doing is doing this. I make this cage. So this is a two-part process. I do the scan and I make in custom tray module in three shape, I make this top portion. And then in mesh mixer, I add these added bars to it. And as you can see, the models are actually notched when I do that. So what happens is I actually have this perfect cage where I can scan scan this in so let's say for example this is an upper obviously so i'll scan the the model itself as the upper and i'll scan the cage as the lower so i'll have when i scan it as a bite i have the perfect alignment of this to this okay so i can use it for uh fabrication of my bar as well as uh for resetting the teeth on the bar so this is what the scan of this looks like it's obviously i've removed all the other extra stuff on it and I can actually bring that in and I can look in 2D cross section and I can tell the clinician, well, let's say, for example, we're doing a hybrid. Now, on a hybrid, I know that I need to have two millimeters from the tissue to the bar, that I need three millimeters of the bar, and then I need another two millimeters to the tooth. Well, altogether here, I have three millimeters. So I know here that I can no longer do a hybrid. So it's a very cool communication tool to send to your clinicians and go, okay, this is what I need and this is what I have. And this is why we can't do what you want us to do, for example, okay? So, and you can go all the way through and look for the other areas. Now here we have plenty of room for the bar and, and everything else, okay? So teeth are removed from the base plates and set on here. And then I sent this case in to a company in California called True Abutments, and they actually created uh, custom locators for this particular case where they brought the locators back palatally and all in line, and we were able to actually just screw that in and get the case just popped right in. Okay, I got two more minutes uh, before we do questions. I want to show you this real cool case real quick, and I will, will, I will answer all you guys' questions. Okay, this was a very first Conus case that I did. I'll be very honest with you, not a huge fan of Conus, but uh, my prosthodontist that I work with is. So we started, this was the very first case we've done. So he sent me this impression with the caps in there. I poured it up with pattern resin um, analogs, let's say. And then the idea was to do this. Uh, and then the caps need to be cemented into the bar that was designed and actually so the bar, uh, the bar was designed by my buddy, uh, Mark. Mark Chen helped me design this because I couldn't figure it out on my own. And we actually sent the files to Bertram Dental Lab in, in Wisconsin, who SLM printed this for us. So the idea here is the doc will cement these secondaries, um, are the secondaries? No, these are tertiaries, onto the secondary caps, uh, chair side and take a new impression. And that way this will act as a frame as well as a verification jig. Okay, but I wanted to make sure he put even pressure on everything. So I actually digitally created these uh, cementation jigs that uh, that were supposed to help to get these things impressed. And this is what they look like. They kind of put more pressure on the tissue and stabilize things so you don't over push things around. Okay, and with that, I was also able to create wax rims to fit directly over the bars and custom trays obviously because once you cement the bars you want to take new impressions okay and this is what the caps look like this is what the uh, cementation jigs looks like and i also was able to create some gothic arch tracers for this particular case okay so this is what i did all of this in in just a couple hours sitting in the computer so this took me about a, a took me about a day to complete um but then again, I'm not that great with CAT CAM yet. And I'm, I'm learning, and this was a while ago, so I'm sure somebody who knows what they're doing will do this a lot quicker, okay? So he sent me back this. So he, when he took the impression, I actually ended up losing one of the implants. This is for the lower. 
So same way I made, made a little analogs with pattern resin and a little bit of raw wire. Everything is set up like this. Now he uh, he ended up not actually using this because we did the setup like he wanted to, like this. I sent it in and he goes, you know what? <laughs> and, and mind you, this was the very first case we ever done in Kona. So I was already stressing out. He goes, you know what? I'm not getting the retention that I want. So we're gonna go in different route. We're actually not gonna use those bars and those caps. We're gonna make the dentures with reinforcement. Uh, but with different kind of caps, we can actually pick up chair side. And we're already trying stage and trying one great. So he's like, no, we, we, I need you to finish it all up at delivery. And uh, another thing is like, well, just in case you, your life isn't hard enough, uh, go ahead and um, make sure you do the interiors in gold. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be ridiculous. So I send my interiors, interior teeth to St uh, Starlight, Starlink, so I can't remember the name of the company. I think it's Starlight, they do uh, gold teeth and gold tooth facings and they did a great job here. So I needed to get it fixed. So I did it kind of an interesting way. So I flask everything again in because it was already set up. And these are the caps that he wanted to use. So the bars are no longer working. So I needed to actually make bars and make sure they fit these caps and also fit my setup. So like 50 things I had to do. And if one of them goes wrong, this whole case is ruined. So I need to make these bars, but I can't really process on these caps. So I scanned this in, first of all, sent it, and uh, the guys at Bertram made me these SLM reinforcements. Now, these are obviously a lot shorter because I didn't want them interfering with my teeth. But I can't process on these gold caps because I know if I do that, I'm going to have issues digging them out, right? And I'm going to ruin them. And they're made out of gold, so that's, money is really an issue here. So what I ended up doing is actually scanning one of those caps in. And creating a, a digital file and just printed a replica of it and processed on the replica and i was just able to go ahead and dig it out after it was processed okay so this is what it looks like boil out stage we got the case processed and finished we got a little bit of an ethnic shade uh, gingiva and the caps are all kind of dug out ground out so the doc can just go ahead and pick this up to your side okay so since we're running out of time i think we're going to stop right here and uh, we have a little bit of time set aside for you guys to answer, uh, for me to answer some of the questions for you guys. So I'm going to. All right. Thank you, Eugene. You're very welcome. Uh, that was uh, a lot of information, but you know, I think it shows that ingenuity, you know, a little bit of just background thinking, you can do almost uh, anything. Um, well, yeah, with, with being know, a technician, we have to have background thinking. Otherwise, we can't do our job, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, it just, it, again, it, it kind of blows me away that, you you know, now we have the means to um, to sort of do workarounds that we really never had to by using some digital platforms and so forth. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so th that was really good. So uh, CE, just let me cover a few things. So we'll make this real quick, get to the questions. Uh, CE, you're going to receive a, an email uh, that will direct you about uh, getting, obtaining your CE. We'll use your information that you use to register with. Uh, the workshop has been recorded. It's going to be posted on the, the Vita Learning uh, North America YouTube. We do have a lot of other webinars that were going on this year, including with uh, with Eugene. So please visit us at the uh, Vita North America uh, courses and see what else is coming up. We do have a special workshop, a remote workshop that Eugene's going to do. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step workflow. So we're going to break this up into three parts, uh, two hours each session, three days in a row. And Eugene is going to express his methodology, his process, his workflow of doing setting up dentures. And so we re really appreciate um, seeing you, you helping us out with this one. No, no so I, I think this is a, a huge opportunity for everyone to, to actually remotely follow along with Eugene as he sets teeth up. We will send you a set of models. We will send you a, a set of teeth. And you'll have an opportunity to just follow Eugene uh, in your lab 
it's going to be a very uh, nice, spectacular uh, workshop, I think. Eugene, how are you feeling about that workshop? I am feeling nervous, but I always do about when I do big things. But it doesn't mean that's not going to be good. I just I have to make sure that I get all my, you know, cr dot my I's and cross my teeth. And I think I'm going to do it. I think you'll be fantastic. You know, it, it, it's nice that, um, you know, we, we have these other training opportunities. We do know that a lot of technicians nowadays, uh, depending on where you're at, Canada and or United States, uh, it's hard to travel. So uh, this this remote uh, workshop will give everyone an opportunity to ask questions. And, and, and it's uh, over a three-day period, so it's it, you don't have to spend all day sitting online. So this is nice. Those of you that uh, need to contact uh, the rep, uh, here's a list of the reps in the area. Uh, so please, uh, you know, let us know. We have uh, help desk also as well that you can contact us here. And then, of course, uh, uh, Gene was uh, gracious enough to, to share his contact information. So uh, if we don't get to your questions today, um, Gene has, um, is okay with you contacting him. Uh, send him an email, drop him a line. He's a, he is a commercial laboratory. He does a lot of traveling. So if he doesn't get back to you right away, um, you know, just be aware that it's sometimes difficult to get a hold of him. Uh, of course, he always answers when I call, so. <laughs> so please, uh, please uh, contact him if you need to. So we're going to do the Q&A. And let me get to everyone's uh, questions here. So one of them was uh, those of you who are asking about the free software, uh, if I recall, that is called Mesh Mixer mm -hmm. that you mentioned, Eugene, right? And that's a free software program that you can uh, work with your other um, uh, open software programs, it sounds yes. like. Okay. Uh, do you normally drop the premolar? You, you showed a case there, I recall. Uh, do you usually drop the the premolar or and not the second molar on your cases, or it depends. I try to I try to not drop the second molar because when it comes to a function, I'd like a broader um, occlusal uh, surface. So if I drop a premolar and I still have a second molar, and I can get a little bit more function out of it if possible. But if my model analysis is showing that, you know what, it's kind of too short, I might have to drop a second molar instead of a premolar. Okay. Uh, do you try to digitally add architecture to the flange area, or do you normally follow up and do a composite, use a composite system to add your texture and stippling? And you know, I generally try to do all my texture post-processing because I kind of specialize on doing uh, facial contouring with composites, so I don't have to worry about too much about doing that initially. Uh, and it doesn't matter if I do uh, if I do analog or digital. I mean, you obviously saw a lot of cases there that weren't uh, facially customized with composite, but uh, I still do quite a, quite a lot of uh, normally processed cases that I customize with composite as well. All right. Uh, and then files, uh, the, the, your information is on the screen. Uh, those that have, again, asked about uh, your Gothic Arch uh, technique, yeah. uh, you mentioned that and, you uh, would... Email me and I'll send you a link, no problem. All right, excellent. So contact me for uh, what do you... Facebook, yeah. yeah. Excellent. So uh, what do you do... What do you or did you use, or do you use, to spray that partial denture before you scanned it? Because the well, metal may not reflect, correct? Yes. I use a very specific dental product. It's called Tresame uh, Dry Hair Shampoo. I buy it at a, a, a dental store called Target. <laughs> and I pay about five bucks. Um, I, I know there's a lot of dental products out there. It's just I spoke with some guys that use this particular thing, and they get really good results, and I got really good results out of it, so that's what I use. Excellent. Yeah, you can't get that stuff at the 99-cent store anymore. 
No. It's at least five bucks. It's at least five bucks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, you mentioned this kind of earlier on the uh, scanner, but what about uh, introduction? If someone wants to get into, say, to print dentures or surgical guides and so forth, do you have any recommendations on a good introduction printer? You know what? Um, you want to make sure that the the printer you're using for intraoral stuff is ver it has a, is part of a verified protocol. I have quite a few printers that are called Frozen. P H R O Z E N, and I have different models. And I know some of them are verified with FDA protocols, and some of them are not. So you want to make sure double check. The printer that I actually use for all my FDA stuff, because I have the printer, the washing station, and the um, and and the curing unit. It's all kind of part of the same thing. Uh, I use the Accurate Assault printer. It's also an LCD printer. It's 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 a, in comparison to other ones, it's fairly inexpensive. Um, because when you go step up from that, you're going to get into DLPs and um, uh, SLAs, I think is, is the right way. The yeah. uh, form labs, I think it's SLA uh, and DLP printers, and they're going to be uh, a little bit more money. I'm not sure form labs is, but um, uh, a SEGA, for example, is a really good DLP printer. It's, it's definitely going to be more money than that. All right, well, we're just about out of time. So um, those of you who uh, have further questions, go ahead and you can email um, Eugene at the email address that, that's on there. You can contact the help desk here at uh, Vita North America as well. Uh, any last thoughts, comments uh, for everyone that's still on the line with us, Gene? Uh, yeah, well, we, you mentioned that the, the course is gonna be coming up. And now we've done, it's not like I'm teaching this course for, for, uh, for the very first time. We've done this course quite a few times. It's just we've done it in person. Um, but it's going to be first time trying to uh, do this course. Uh, instead of talking to people, I'll be talking to a camera. So it might be a little bit jittery. But um, what I what I want to suggest uh, besides the course thing, guys, is that don't take too long about, uh, you know, if you want to progress your career uh, and you're going to be doing this for a few more years at least, digital is going to have to be part of it because I have to be honest with you, more and more stuff that I'm getting in is digital. Like the doctors are no longer just sending in regular impressions and regular models. I get scans in all the time. You know, the doctors are buying intraoral scans like crazy. And for them to take a intraoral scan for initial impression, a lot of times it's a lot easier just, just to, than to, you know, mix up alginate or all that stuff. And there's no gagging involved. So if you're going to be doing this for some time or a long time, you need to start getting into this because otherwise you're going to have a little bit of an issue down the line. Yeah, no, it's, it's a technology for sure that uh, we all have to embrace, uh, that, those of us that are in the, uh, the dental field. So I want to thank you very much, uh, Eugene, for doing this. Uh, a lot of good information. Uh, appreciate it. We look forward to the, to the workshop, the remote workshop. Um, we'll, we'll get through any, um, any jitters uh, through that as we do it. So I would like to uh, thank everyone, the audience, for uh, joining us as well. And this will conclude today's webinar with uh, Mr. Eugene Rosengert. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.